Well, good morning. Good morning. It's uh, Saturday, February the 4th, and it's cold out there. Not as cold as it is up in Canada, I know, but certainly colder than Florida. And uh, PK and Charlotte's Rise and Shine this morning consisted of their photographs and short videos celebrating Charlotte's birthday. Happy birthday, Charlotte. We miss you and we love you so much. We're going to carry on in the Bible, the King James Bible. The book of Matthew, chapter 22, and it's verses 23 to 46. And if you remember yesterday, the Pharisees just won't let up on Jesus, will they? Well, today he addresses them and the Sadducees, and he kind of puts an end to all this ridiculous questioning. So here we go. Chapter 22, verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him. Now the Sadducees and the Pharisees were two different sects of Jews. And um, the Sadducees, let me get this right, believed in the Torah only, which is the first five books of Moses. And the Pharisees believed in the whole of the Old Testament. So the Pharisees were, were very legalistic in as much as, you know, the whole of the Old Testament. Um, and they had the advantage of having read all the prophecies that were in the rest of the Old Testament, which the Sadducees wouldn't accept. So there we go. Carry on. Verse 24. Saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err, not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, having not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, God is not the God of the dead, but the living. And when the multitude hear us, heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees formed the Sanhedrin, which was kind of like the ruling church body of the Jewish church at the time, made up of those two sects. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord, all in capital letters, said unto my Lord, with a capital L, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Yea, Jesus. <laughs> he soon put them to bed, didn't he? He spoke with authority, and he spoke of things that they dared not consider or speak of. 
This is why they found him to be a heretic and commit heresy, because he was claiming to be the son of David, the son of God, the Messiah. But they couldn't come to grips with that. And the reason they couldn't come to grips with it was because he was an ordinary man. I mean, he had a tradesman's background. He came from Nazareth. What good comes out of Nazareth, they said, you know. Uh, they held, Nazareth was in the north, it was in the mountains, it was in a valley in between the mountains, I believe. Um, nothing much happened there. It was a little sort of backward place, and uh, no great people come out of there, no great learning, no great philosophers, nothing like that, which is very typical of the humbleness and the humility of Jesus Christ, that he came as one of them. This is something we need to understand. And to be called Jesus of Nazareth from the Galilee region, just put him down there amongst all those regular, ordinary people. He wasn't exalted. He didn't, wasn't born into a rich royal family in a castle or palace. He was born in a manger to a poor family of craftsmen from an area that wasn't renowned for anything in particular. But this man was saying things that were very profound because he spoke with authority. And although they could hear it, although they could witness it, although they could see his miracles, it conflicted with their vision of who the Messiah was going to be. They were looking for a savior that was going to save them from the Roman oppression. And so you can see how, and, and you, you have to walk a mile in someone else's boots to understand them, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Sadducees who made up the Sanhedrin were the ruling body. All they had until Jesus was born, and for the last 400 years, they hadn't heard from any prophets or anything. All they had was the Torah and the Old Testament to guide them. They had the Mosaic Law. And, and they felt that they were told from God, the covenant through Abraham and passed down to them, this was how you should live from Moses. This is how you should live. They were rescued by Moses out of Egypt. They knew all those stories. They knew that. But everything that God was instilling upon him now, and I'm reading Exodus, because I'm also reading Old and New Testament every morning for myself. And it's God was very thorough, very detailed about everything, about how the tabernacle should be built, right down to the silver and brass couplings and the stitch work and the type of materials and the, the type of wood and how it should look and how it should be overlaid with gold and brass and the robes and the detail that went into the robes. God was giving them all these specific things. And when God gives you something very specific, and that's all you've got, and then along comes this guy, for want of a better word, a carpenter. They now think that he was probably a stonemason, but a craftsman from Nazareth. Out of nowhere comes this guy, speaking the way he does, performing miracles, speaking with authority, without even referring to Scripture, he's quoting Scripture, which a lot of people could do, then it was a big conflict in their minds. And they're saying, no, no, this, this, this goes against what we're being told. This is, you know, we're, we're praying, we're following the law of Moses, and this guy's coming along, and the, the image of the Messiah is not, this guy doesn't fit that image. He's teaching us about something else, and they're right. He was. It's a beautiful scene in The Chosen where Nicodemus sits down with Jesus up on that rooftop. And, and the picture you get of this conversation that was taking place and, and the apostle recording the conversation, sitting on the steps, writing everything down so that it could be recorded in Scripture later on in the Gospels. Nicodemus was saying, this is not going to go down well, you know, with the Sanhedrin. This is, they're not going to take this well. And Jesus was telling him that it was about sin. And, you know, 
Nicodemus says, this is all about sin. And, and Jesus is saying, yes, and it's about the kingdom to come, the eternal kingdom. And, and something flipped in Nicodemus that he could understand that. And he realized he was in the presence of the Lord. And he fell down on his knees to worship him. I mean, this guy was high up in the Pharisees, but the penny had dropped. This is, he knew who he was, who he was. And Jesus just picked him up and hugged him and he cried. It's a powerful moment. I, I, I thank God for Dallas putting together this series, The Chosen, because it puts into pictures, into words, into a graphic presentation that you can see some of these scenes that come right out of the Bible. And some of the words are word for word. Obviously, they have poetic license. They fill the gaps in between. That's okay. It's in keeping with the scripture. It doesn't take away from the scripture. I urge you to watch it. It is the most powerful thing you will ever watch. Forget football and all the other stuff. Try watching The Chosen. Watch season one from the beginning. It is so powerful. So powerful. The presentation is excellent. It just helps you to, to picture and to envisage what's going on and what's taking place so that you can understand why these things happen. I mean, when you think about it, why did they nail an innocent man to the cross? Does it ever occur to you? He was innocent. He was sinless. But they nailed and they punished the most humiliating and painful punishment that there could ever be at the time. Nailed him to a cross. And he was innocent. They, they killed an innocent man. How did they do that? You, you must understand the background of what took place. Because then you'll understand what's taking place now. What's taking place in men's hearts today? And you'll understand what the Holy Spirit, what Jesus Christ is up against even today. It still exists. How men's hearts are hardened about what their expectations are. And of course, they're watching us as Christians. And unfortunately, many Christians let down the side because people are watching and they see how you handle a situation. And if you're handling it in a Christ-like way, you're shining the light of Jesus. But if you're handling it in an earthly way, if you're acting the same as then, then they're turning around and saying, well, what's the benefit? What, you know, what, what's to be gained out of this? But if you handle it the way a Christian does, and it's hard, it's not easy. It's, it's a process, I can tell you. I don't think I'm truly there yet myself, but I'm working on it. That is the sanctification process. When you do that, then they turn around and say, how come he's not all worked up the way we are? What is it that's different about him? He's even got, he has a peace about him. There's something, there's something about him. He says he's a Christian. Well, what, what's going on there? You see? See how the seed gets planted in their hearts when they see the light of Jesus shining through you? That's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference. Anyway, the sun is shining. The temperatures are going to be, it's not going to be a warm day, but the sun is shining. Thank you, Lord. And we're going to be into the 40s later on this week. Tomorrow is going to be in the 40s. So get out there and enjoy God's world. Enjoy the beauty of nature. Enjoy God's Word, the Holy Bible. And please take time to go over it and read it again and, and take into account these passages and try to look at them from the points of view of other people within the Bible and what's taking place. Well, well why, why is he acting that way? Why is he asking that question? Okay. It, it'll start sinking in. You ask the Holy Spirit to be with you and to help you explain these things and to give you discernment and understanding and wisdom of the word. I don't get it all. I certainly don't. I know that there's pastors who could take virtually 
every line of scripture there and make a whole sermon out of it. David Jeremiah did every line of scripture from Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm, and he had a he had a sermon on every line. Can you believe that? A sermon on every line of scripture. Old to have that much discernment and understanding, huh? Well, thank you for listening. I hope you have a great day. Remember, God loves you. I love you too. Oh, and by the way, this morning's men's breakfast was fantastic. The power of the Holy Spirit permeates each and every one of us. And the prayers and the earnesty of our brothers in Christ is just a wonderful thing. Thank you for listening. Bye for now. Speak to you later.